and he takes his time to tell us that his fingertips and his ears had been frostbit, but they were healing, unfortunately. Upon arriving home, I've been horrified to discover that my nether regions were frost nipped as well. While the ears and the cheeks were already healing, the todger wasn't. Oh gosh. Why does he tell us this? And then he goes on to talk about the fact that, you know, he didn't mention it to any of the guys at the party. Thanks for that. I mean, how are you gonna just sit there and be like, Sitting, uh, sitting at the table being like, by the way, you guys, I'm having a lot of problems in my areas. Good morning, how are you? So happy to see you this Sunday morning. Um, welcome to I'll Spare You the Details, where we are going through Prince Harry's spare. Painfully and slowly, but we're here doing it together. And in today's episode, we get to talk about so many things that I've wanted to talk about. Finally, we get to William and Kate's wedding. We are also going to be talking about frostbitten appendages. Um, we're going to talk about this weird trip he takes down the river and has a moment with an elephant. You guys, this guy needs so much help. He doesn't get the message unless an animal comes and looks him in the eye. Then suddenly all things are revealed. So we've got that going on. We've got his frostbite going on. We've got so Okay, Harry comes across as just such an Eeyore, the entire book, but specifically in this chapter, it's like there's so many opportunities when he could see things in a positive light and he actively and aggressively chooses to see it in a negative way, time and time again. Well, I mean, I will, I'll point it out to you. He also is going right back to licking his wounds about mommy's dad and, you know, it's just that he's 25 at this point, and I'm not saying you ever get over the death of your mother. My, my mom died when I was young, as I've mentioned before. I will still have moments when it's like overwhelmingly sad to me that my mom's not here. Obviously, she's my mom. But to, to look so ag aggressively, to be wounded and hurt, to be just unable to go on, and everything reminds him of his mother. It's like, what a crippling way to live. I just can't imagine. I cannot. So um, there's lots of that. Um, he, he takes a moment to talk about how he went to uh, Berlin to pay his respects to the Holocaust victims. Um, he says it was some more contrition for what he had done five years earlier at the party. And remember that because there's something he says specifically in that. It's, it's very small. It's like one paragraph. But he says something that I'm just like, you really are revealing yourself here. Um, so wait for that. Uh, he talks a lot about, well, we'll just go to it when we get to the wedding. But the way he talks about William, so massively disrespectful to his brother. I just can't see why he would want to talk. I don't see what he thinks he's saying about himself when he talks so unkindly about others. We'll never know. But um, anyway, so there is just, it's just jam-packed. So we got to get into it because there's just so much to talk about. But um let's see any channel business we need to talk about before we get into it um oh okay in the process of reading all the comments uh there has been something that's been brought up enough numbers enough of times that i'm realizing okay this isn't just an anomaly or one person didn't get it so i just wanted to say that um if you are confused about the way this channel works and it really might only be the four of you that are confused but if four of you took the time to say something maybe there's more people who are confused i make three long episodes a week um and then between those days i'll cut up those longer episodes into clips but what i kept hearing was people were saying why am i seeing the same videos like multiple times um and I, I wouldn't say that you're seeing the same video multiple times but you might have watched a clip and you'd also seen the longer episode now i am by no means the first person who ever created this idea i mean joe rogan was doing this like what 15 years ago and so to cut up a longer episode isn't my idea i just stole it from the greats but Maybe I didn't label those videos accurately enough so that you could figure out that you'd already seen this um, content. So yesterday I went through and I, in the title, made sure you knew that it was a clip. So if there's been any frustration surrounding the way I've organized what content is on my page, hopefully that cleared some of that up. 
let's get into it. When he turns 25, he decides that he's going to go have his birthday in Africa. So he goes down to see the crew, Tish, Mike, Addie. Um, Chels also, I believe, is featured. They seem like they kind of um, reunited for a brief encounter. Anyway, so he goes on saying that his 25th birthday was, you know, a milestone for him because that was the time when he thought perhaps he would begin to veer on towards manhood and really become aware of the person that he was meant to be. I don't know how he thought he was going to like, how 25 was going to suddenly reveal all things to him, but he seems to have that expectation. So he says that while he was there, um, the night of his birthday, Mike took him aside and was like, look, you really love Africa, but you're a taker, not a giver. Tell us something we don't know. And he said, you really need to think about how you can shine a light on the needs of Africa. You have the spotlight, so give us some of it as well. So Harry's like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll think about that. So um, after this meaningful conversation, he decides to go on a river cruise. They decide to um, pile in about a, a bunch of flat bottom boats and they decide to go up river. And they're like camping and boating and it's like a long thing. Well, in the course of these days, um, one night they, it's raining, they're listening to music, it's all mellow and dreamy, it's all just so lovely in this African twilight, and they're drinking and guzzling the alcohol, as one does, including the driver of the boat. Anyway, as they're going down the river, as it's beginning to get dark, uh, terror strikes because a major storm comes in. And it's dark and it's storming. And he says either one of those things would have been a problem, but together they were in real trouble. So he says that the real problem was that the driver was completely drunk and totally wasted and he couldn't steer the boat and he kept plowing into sandbars. And Harry's like, we might end up in this river tonight. I shouted that I was going to take the wheel. And he says he said that, but then never says if he did or not. So I guess it's, it's just him throwing out this little, hey, I was a hero to you guys. I saw that there was a need and, and I said I'd, I'd fulfill the need. I'm not going to comment on whether I did or not, but I thought about it. And then he says, okay that there was a brilliant flash of lightning. And in that moment, they saw directly across from them in the middle of the river, some enormous elephants. Another animal? Another animal suddenly, when, whenever he's high or drinking or whatever, he suddenly sees these animals. Here we go again. And they cut the engines and they sit there and they stare at the animals. And he says, when I stared at the elephant closest to me, when I looked deep into her eyeball, singular, when she looked back into mine, I thought of the all-seeing eye of the Apache, and I thought of the Koh-i-Noor diamond, and I thought of a camera's lens, convex and glassy like the elephant's eye, except that a camera lens always makes me nervous, and this eye made me feel safe. This eye wasn't judging me, wasn't taking. It just was. If anything, the eye was slightly tearful. Was it possible? How can you tell? It's storming. The animal is out there in a river with torrential rain falling on its head. I'm sure, it did look a little teary. And he goes like, you know, then after a minute, you know, we, we went on, started the engines, got our act together, got back down the river. And he's like, everything for one se half second was one. Everything made sense after looking into the eye of the elephant, the single eye of the elephant. This was his momentary arrival to redemption. It's like, I, I thought how it felt to be so close to the truth, the real truth. After staring at that elephant, I knew. Life isn't all good, but it isn't all bad. Y'all, we're going, we're, I don't know why he bothers to tell us about this revelation he had. Because like, literally this entire section is him viewing the world through the most 
um, dysfunctional and depressed lens that he possibly could. So I don't know why he's telling us about how the elephant told him to look at the good because he, he doesn't proceed to do it. It's the same thing as when he went and talked to the rabbi. And he's like, the rabbi told me to forgive myself because I wore the Nazi uniform and that, you know, forgiveness was, you know, one of the highest qualities and, and all this. And then he goes on to say, but I'll never forgive myself. He just finished telling me the rabbi was super wise. And then he's like, I don't know what that guy was talking about. The same thing here. The elephant is trying to tell him, I guess, that he needs to look at the good and it isn't always bad. And he's like, I'll never forget this moment. And then he also said, try to remember how it felt finally to understand what Mike had been saying. Shine a light. It's like he needed to see an elephant in a storm on a boat in the river under the threat of a drunk captain to understand that he should give some charitable aid to Africa. The, this was how the stars needed to line for you. Storm, drunk captain, elephant, night, strike of lightning. Oh, I should really think about helping Africa. The way this guy's mind thinks, I mean, I can't keep up. Okay, so then he talks about how he finally got his wings. He claims he got his wings. I don't know. Other folks say he didn't, but he says he did. And he says, Pa pinned them on him. And he said that they saluted each other and it was more intimate than a hug. Then he talks about how he and Chels were on again, off again, and they just had to get real because she wanted to party and live it up and travel and, you know, live out her youth. And he couldn't really hang out with her that much. Like maybe he'd be able to see her a handful of times in the next few years, but he was going off to war. So what was he, what, how could he really be who she needed him to be? And that they kept dragging it out and they went to Africa and they got in a riverboat as they do. And then mom, Mom T had to walk in and be like, children, mm -mm -mm. no, no, no. You guys are not right for each other. So go your separate ways and stop dragging your feet on this. So they decide that they're going to be grown up about it and just realize it's not meant to be. And, you know, don't waste the most precious thing there is, says T, time. Harry's like, oh yeah, like, like Sergeant Bully used to say, about the time. Oh yeah, I've only got so much of that stuff. Um, then he talks about how he and William went to Lesotho and they did some work there for the children with HIV. And in this really rare bit of self-reflection, he talks about how while they were there in Africa, they went way up on this mountain where there's a school and the little and the shepherd boys would come two days a week to go to school there and it's heartbreaking the way he describes it because they would work these 12 hour days then they would walk for two hours up to this mountain to get an education just two days a week but it was it meant so much to them i mean and, and the things that they would go through i mean it was heartbreaking to read he said <clears throat> It defied belief after 12 hours of tending their cattle and sheep. They'd walk for two hours through mountain passes just to learn maths, reading, and writing. Such was their hunger to learn. They braved sore feet, bitter cold, and far worse. They were so vulnerable on the road, so exposed to the elements, several had died from lightning strikes. Many had been attacked by stray dogs, and they dropped their voices and told us how many of them had been abused by wanderers and wrestlers and nomads and other boys but all of that just to get to the school just to learn and harry says i felt ashamed to think of all my bitching about school and about anything like oh my gosh thank you thank you shepherd boys for shedding a light on harry's selfishness about all of the education that he had that was like an eaten education that he was never thankful for and these poor boys who had worked 12 hours in a field would walk two hours up a mountain in the elements braving all kinds of threats to get an education thank god harry got a chance to sit down with them and he said that he and william brought them gifts and it, it was like a just a wonderful time where he could give to them and, and and lighten their loads just momentarily so that was a sweet passage i enjoyed that um but when they came back from this little boys trip this this aid to Africa trip. What should he find out? But that William's getting married. <laughs> when was somebody going to tell him about that? When was somebody going to finally care about bringing him into the family and telling him? 
he says it was all news to him, that the papers had been flooded with a bunch of fake stories about how he had been the one to give the ring to William, the, the famous sapphire ring. But he's like, it wasn't even mine to give. Like, you know, I, he already had it. As soon as mommy died, he couldn't wait to rip that thing off her hand and take it for himself. So he says, he goes on this long tirade about how here it was, William getting the thing first. William coming to his bride first. Now he's going to come to fatherhood first. Now he's going to have his kids first. Everything's first for him. And he says that he'd always thought that he was going to be the dad first because, I mean, he wanted it so badly. He always thought he was going to be the one to get married first. Because when you want something, that's how you get it. And he, he was sure he wanted it more than William did. And he says that now we go on to a long passage about, I had to be a young dad because I couldn't be like my dud dad. I couldn't be like Pa. Pa was the worst. You know, when we were younger, Pa used to actually have some fun with us. But, you know, that petered out real quick. And then all we got was old fuddy-duddy Pa and his boring ways and his schedules and, you know, it just became so lame. And I always promised myself I'd never be like that. I'm never going to be like that old man. Just, you know, too old to do anything. He used to roll us up in rugs and shake us out of them and make us laugh. But not anymore. Not anymore. And he says that. He's like, long before we were ready, he stopped engaging in that kind of physical play. Just didn't have the enthusiasm didn't have the puff all right well you know why are you wasting your time with girls that you know you don't want to marry if you're so like all rearing to go and get married then what are you doing running around with page three girls or you know rolling around in the grass with old ladies who we now know are like 19 year old girls what a load that was it took two weeks and finally like the the real woman comes out and she's like I was literally two years older than him. What is he talking about? <laughs> Poor woman. None of his actions would show that he cared to get married, but it's everybody else's fault that he's not walking down the aisle. Um. Anyway, so while he's over there mourning the fact that his brother's getting married and he isn't, and he never, you know, he's it's always getting second best. It's always somebody sloppy seconds for him. He decides, uh, he, he finds out that he has been invited to go on this trip um, with a group of veterans who have sustained some serious injuries. They're trying to raise a bunch of money for the uh, walking with the wounded. And he's going to go with a bunch of amputees to the North Pole, um, unsupported. And they wanted him to join them. So he was really excited to do it but it's going to bump up right against William's wedding and so he's trying to think okay like how can I do this and make it to the wedding and you know once again William's always hedging in on my good time I want to go walk the North Pole with a bunch of amputees but I can't because William and Kate want me to be there for this wedding what a dumb idea and he says that JLP was like, you got to do it. It's a once in a lifetime thing. You'll be able to get back for the wedding. And before he does that, he has to go to Berlin. Um, they had planned this for years, apparently. And they wanted him to go and pay his respects to the victims of the Holocaust. And he just writes about it. This is a person who can't fathom other people's emotions beyond his own. When he's writing about his own emotions, it's already sort of, he's always overwriting everything. But then when he's writing about how he should feel about somebody else, it always ends up just being so much trash. So much, it's like a middle school creative writing project. He says um, that in December 2010, on a bitterly cold day, he says, I put my fingertips in the bullet holes in the city's walls, the still fresh scars from Hitler's insane vow to fight to the last man. I stood at the former site of the Berlin Wall, which had also been the site of SS torture chambers, and I swore I could hear the echoes of the agonizing screams on the wind. Look, here's the thing. All of that is so 
it's like the most traumatic time in collective memory. That's why everyone seems to only ever be able to reference that as their, like people don't know anything about history, but they do know about Nazis and Hitler and all this. Um, and so I am not saying that he shouldn't have felt a huge degree of emotion there, but just the way he writes about it, it's, it's just trying so hard to make us believe he felt something in that moment. But the thing that I referenced, I think in the beginning of this, that I just, the thing that really stood out to me in this whole visit to Berlin is when he says, I met a woman who'd been sent to Auschwitz. She described her confinement, the horror she saw, heard, and smelt. Her stories were as difficult to hear as they were vital. But I won't retell them. They're not mine to tell. Why didn't he apply that idea to the entirety of his book? as he tells us all sorts of things about family members that weren't his stories to tell. Harken back to Pa and the teddy bear. What was that? What, that was his story to tell? And he's going to go on when he's talking about the wedding. He's going to go on to tell some things about William that I'm like, okay, so you can, you have respect for the woman from Auschwitz, which is fantastic. But also, what about don't tell the stories of your brother? Don't tell the stories of your dad. What about just shut up? Anyway, he says that um, now it was time to go to the North Pole. And he says that he was horrified and just felt that he was in bizarro world because according to local law, you're not allowed to leave the town without a gun because of the polar bears. <laughs> so, um, contrary to the way the rest of us are living, where they're trying to get guns out of our hands, there they're like pressing guns into your hands and be like, don't leave without one. Um, so he says it was really uh, cold. Surprisingly, at the North Pole, it was just brutal. 30 degrees below zero. And their little trip was delayed by some days because of the coldness. And he was concerned because Willie's wedding's any day now, and he can't be late to it. And, you know just feeling sour that he even has to factor it into his planning. So he says that one of the greatest detriments to your comfort and survival is uh, getting too hot through physical exertion and then sweating and then that sweat's gonna freeze on you and then you're gonna have frostbite. Well, according to him, he says, no one even told him that that was a possibility. <laughs> okay, well, well, first of all, could you not surmise that the beads of sweat on your face would freeze instantly when you walk outside and your eyes are already freezing seems to stands to reason that the difficulty that you're feeling to breathe as your lungs freeze inside of you at 30 degrees below zero and as your eyes are freezing at the corners that you would realize that sweat is probably also going to be your true arch nemesis in this scenario he doesn't put two and two together he says that other people were told about this but no one bothered to tell him he didn't get the debriefing so as he's pulling these sleds through the snow, these super heavy sleds on this walk and just drenched in sweat, um, he had no ability, he did not have the knowledge to realize that this was dangerous. Well, as he's sweating and he's realizing that his ears and his um, fingers are freezing and he's getting frostbite. What I think is weird is he makes this big point about how the sweat is what was going to give you frostbite. But I'm like, were you sweating on your ears and fingertips? That's just where you'd get frostbite. That's kind of thing. It, it, it's got nothing to do with the fact that somebody failed to give you information you needed. That's just where it happens. Anyway, so that was bad. <clears throat> and he says he didn't complain. He wants to let you know that. Well, who are you going to complain to? A bunch of amputees who are also out here suffering the same things you are? Who exactly were you thinking would hear it anyway? So big whoop that you didn't complain. Anyway, unfortunately, on the day on day four, he had to leave because William's wedding. And uh, generously, he the pilot that was with him did fly him to the North Pole because he's like, oh, you're so close, you know, you got to see it. So he gets to see the North Pole, play at the Union Jack or hold the Union Jack. I don't know. He says he was just holding it. Then they go off, um, and he goes to the wedding. Okay. Now we come to the set part of the story where I'm just like, what that you gave your brother the same respect that you gave to the Auschwitz survivor? Because you just keep on trying to make him look like this just total loser. 
you, 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 you keep trying to make us believe that he was just, that there's no redeeming qualities about him. He says that on the night of the, the night before the wedding, all the, all the men were together and you know, they were having some drinks and they had plied William with a couple of rums and cokes because he had like, he was nervous. He had all these jitters going. And so they thought that they would help him. And he also says, he, he wants to let you know that you might've thought he was the best man. Well, you were lied to. He was not the best man. Nobody trusted him to be the best man. He, they thought he was gonna say something stupid and he probably would have, okay? Yeah, you, you, they couldn't trust him. He'll admit it. But still, the fact that you were led to believe that he was the best man is a shame that you, you know, you're, you're always being lied to as the public. It's just one more lie that he's gonna have to tell you that you've been forced to believe. He says his, that William's best men were actually two guys named James and Thomas who were a little bit quiet and reserved. And the reason that they did not let on that Harry was the, wasn't the best man is that they were trying to protect James and Thomas. Because if anybody found out that they were best men, then the press would descend. This is Harry's explanation. Anyway, they're plying William with drinks. And he takes his time to tell us that his fingertips and his ears had been frostbitten, but they were healing, unfortunately. Upon arriving home, I've been horrified to discover that my nether regions were frost nipped as well. And while the ears and the cheeks were already healing, the todger wasn't. Oh gosh. Why does he tell us this? And then he goes on to talk about the fact that you know, he didn't mention it to any of the guys at the party. Thanks for that. I mean, how are you going to just sit there and be like, sitting, uh, sitting at the table being like, by the way, you guys, I'm having a lot of problems in my areas. Like, what are you going to say? How are you going to bring that up anyway? But he's like, I don't know why I should have been reluctant to discuss my penis with Pa or all the gentlemen present. It was a matter of public record. And indeed, some public curiosity. The press had written about it extensively. There's countless stories in books and papers, even the New York Times, about Willie and me not being circumcised. Mummy had forbidden it, they all said. And while it's absolutely true that the chance of getting penile frostbite is much greater if you're not circumcised, all the stories were false. I was snipped as a baby. Okay. Well, you're annoyed that the public has this rabid curiosity about your... <gasps> manhood but it's like why are you feeding the press more stories that you think it's disgusting they'd want to hear in the first place classic harry it's like all he ever does is say why does the press want these stories about me let me shovel them to the press it's like when he was saying everybody says i'm just drunk and falling in the streets and then he'd go and be drunk and falling in the streets and now with this like you know, the press is always so so weirdly curious about everything, even down to that detail about me. Okay, that is weird. I would say that's odd. I don't know why we care about what's going on with you. That sounds like a personal situation to me. But though, why are you feeding into that and being like, you guys always got it wrong, by the way. You guys were always wrong about my todger, okay? Let me just set the record straight about that. I was circumcised. What business is it of ours if you were or weren't? Who cares? I don't care. Like, why are you telling us this? Truly, why are you? If the press is so out of control and always digging up all this stuff about you that doesn't matter, why don't you give us a book full of stuff that matters instead of more stuff on the same level that you condemn them for being interested in? Harry doesn't make any sense. Harry doesn't make any sense. Um, okay. He says that William was really tipsy at this point and they were all at Clarence's house. Um, at the, 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 the eve of the wedding. And there, the streets were lined with people who were camping and it was revelry and everyone was hoping to see, be, you know, be in the streets in the morning when the wedding came. And um, William looks out the window and he's like, I want to go down to those people. Like, they're all here to celebrate me and, and I want to go out to them. And Harry's looking at him like, well, you are incredibly wasted, so maybe don't go. And William's like, I'm going and you're coming with me. And Harry claims that William was begging him to come. So Harry's like, 
I could see in his eyes that the rum was really hitting hard. He needed a wingman. <sighs> Painfully familiar role for me, but all right. He's just always so preyed upon. Why is everyone always taking advantage of him? So he says they go out to the street. Everyone is just overjoyed for William, overjoyed for Catherine. Just, they, it's just this outpouring of love. And here we get a classic Harry response. He says, they gave us both the same teary smiles, the same looks of fondness and pity that they did way back in 1997. I couldn't help but shake my head. Here it was, the eve of Willie's big day, one of the happiest of his life, and there was simply no avoiding the echoes of his worst day, our worst day. It's like, Harry, why are you seeing it that way? Why are you choosing to be like, all oh, these people are rubbing our face in the fact that our mom's dead? No, they're not. It's just that they've watched you grow up and they're so proud of the men that you're becoming, at least one of you. And it's like, there is this parental warmth that these people feel towards you. In the same way that your dad probably looked at William and thought, oh, I wish that Diana had been here to see him and to see this man that he's becoming, this beautiful woman that is going to be his wife. It's like, why are you looking at it in such a negative way? What does it do for you? How do you get through life with such a weight on your back? Okay, so he says that he looked at William and he's like, well, this guy is wasted. Like, look at his face. It's bright red. We've got to get this guy back into the house. So he drags William back in. They go their separate ways. It's just been very emotional and they're also very drunk. And so it's like, let's go to bed. So he says the next day he comes to pick William up. I was shocked when I went to collect him in the morning. He looked as if he hadn't slept a wink. His face was gaunt and his eyes were red. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> but he wasn't. He was, he was wearing his bright red uniform of the Irish Guards, not his household cavalry frock coat uniform, and I wondered if that was the matter. He'd asked Granny if he could wear his household cavalry kit, and she turned him down. And as the heir, he must wear the number one ceremonial, she declared. William was glum at having so little to say in what he wore to get married, at having his autonomy taken from him on such an occasion. He told me several times that he felt frustrated. Okay, but if he told you that, it was in confidence. So why are you taking this little bit of information that he gave you and just putting it in your book like it's none of your business to say that? Even if he was frustrated, even if he did feel like he was kicking up a little uh, against um, the the hierarchy that wanted him to do certain things. And even if he did feel disappointed because he would have preferred to wear his household cavalry frock or whatever. That's not your story to tell. It's not your story to tell if he was frustrated with Granny. Although I doubt that he was. How could he have ever thought he was going to wear anything but that? Just because he asked for permission to do something else doesn't mean he ever thought he was going to get permission to do it. I don't think that he's sitting over there nursing his wounds over there like you are all the day, day long. This would have blown you out of the water if somebody told you you couldn't wear what you wanted to wear. But I don't think that William has ever looked at his life. And so it's a series of choices that he's going to get to make all the time for himself. He knows his role. He's never bucked against it. So if he said, I, th I think one time he could have said to Harry, oh, it's too bad. I asked her if I could wear, you know, what I wanted. And she said no. So anyway, that's too bad. It could have been as much of, like, that could have been the conversation. And then Harry's over there like, he can't get past it. And that's why he stayed up all night. That's why he looked so bad. Because he, he was so upset about what he was going to wear at his own wedding. What guy is that worried about? I think he, no guy is staying up all night long being like, I really wanted to wear something else to my wedding. I think I'll just choose not to sleep and look like trash. They get into the Bentley and they drive on. And he says, as the car pulled away, I broke the silence. You reek. The aftermath of last night's rum. I jokingly cracked a window and pinched my nose, offered him some mints. The corners of his mouth bent slightly downward. Okay, you are going to tell me that your brother is about to marry Catherine Middleton. And he is going to arrive at this royal event not having bothered to brush his teeth, that he is rolled out of bed, groggy-eyed, reeking of rum, you know, tugging on his uniform, staggering to the car, pumping himself down, tears streaming down his cheeks because he can't wear what he wants to wear, but he's got to do it. Like this whole picture is completely and totally a lie. 
He did not show up to his wedding with last night's rum on his breath. Get out of here with that. Do you not know that we all watched the wedding? He did not look like he just got off a bender. Come on. Okay, so he says that they pull up to Westminster Abbey. Nothing like getting married in the same place where your mom died. Oh, man. Okay, um, well, Harry, it's called life. And why are you looking at it this way? Isn't it a beautiful thing that you could replace sorrow with joy? That at the same place where you had laid your mother to rest, you could now come in and ring in joy and new, like, new adventures and new life and... and I just don't understand looking at it that way. Why are you, why are you choosing? And then he goes on this long jag about Westminster Abbey's the worst anyway, because you're sitting on top of all these dead people crammed under the pews and in the walls. It's a real weird place to be in the first place. Why do you want to get married at such a cemetery? And it's like, but that is the beauty of life. Like we each have our time on, on, on this earth. And, and, and it's like, what? I don't understand. Like, why would you look at it that way? Here, it's like, it's almost like you are surrounded by all of these, all of these greats in, in, in English history are, are there to attend every big moment in the history as it continues to progress and to move forward. Like, it's a beautiful picture. It's like, who can separate us? You know, that we will continue through this together. It's like, I don't know. It, it's kind of a really beautiful thing that it's not only just those on this earth, but also in the next. They're together, you and the saints together. I, mean, I don't know. I, I think it's a beautiful idea. And I don't understand why he's choosing to see it in such bleak terms. But he doesn't seem to be able to look at life any other way. Um, then he goes, between these thoughts of mummy and death and my frostbitten penis, I was in danger of becoming as anxious as the groom. I'm like, are you joking here? I don't know. Um, he says he tried to lighten the mood and joke with, with William, who seemed really sort of jumpy and anxious, and he just couldn't seem to cut through all that anxiety, so he gave up trying. Then he says that he can't remember anything about the wedding. Like, whatever. You know, Kate looked good. That's all he he knows. And he says that he really liked her. She she was more like a sister to him than than a, just a sister-in-law. Like, he felt like she was a sister that, he, that they had never had. But he says, but in my gut, I couldn't help feeling that this was yet another farewell under this horrid roof. And it's like, you always have said to us that William kept you at arm's length. That there was that one glimmer of brotherhood when you guys lived together during flight training. But other than that, William has always been your arch nemesis. He's never cared about you. He's always held you at arm's length. So what do you care if he gets married and you never see him again? How does that change anything for you? It won't change anything for you because you say he's never loved you anyway. Um, and then he, of course, he's like, I felt the same way when Pa married Camilla because, of course, I knew I'd never see him again and I'd never see him anymore. And now I was never going to see William. And a, a wedding's nice, they say, but really all it is is a low-key funeral. He says a low-key funeral. Who even says that? What an American term. Um, then he goes on to say that the thing that just was terrible about the whole thing is that he had become accustomed to having somebody by his side and that he was losing that. And all I can think is, okay, well, when exactly was this that William was by your side? You've made an enormous point about the fact that he never was. So why are you pretending that you are so hurt and that you are so rejected in this moment? You can't tell us two things. We're not... You might be this thick, but we aren't. We remembered like three pages back when you were saying that William never cared about you. Um, anyway, he goes on to tell about how he hadn't been allowed to give any long speeches uh, because he wasn't really the best man. But they did allow him to speak for two minutes. And in that two minutes, he proceeded to tell everybody about how somebody had sent Kate a little ermine thong that they had fashioned out of a couple of animals that they had found and he had it there to show and i'm like well no wonder nobody let you speak what in the world um and he he ended it with a couple of words about how much he wished that 
his mother could have been there and how much she would have loved William and Catherine's love story. And he's like, I made sure not to look at Pa and Camille when I said that. Like, he's really sticking it to them. Uh, I'm sure they're thinking the same thing. I'm sure they would love it if Diana had been present to see the wedding, to be at the wedding of, of, his, of her son. You're not sticking to anybody to be like, that I mentioned her. <laughs> right in Pa and Camilla's presence. <laughs> okay. Big club. All right, so that is the end of what we've got to talk about today. Harry, as always, did not come off very well. And, you know, as I was I was up this morning doing my makeup, getting ready to film, I was thinking about Harry, and I thought, why is he so easy to hate? Because Harry is just so, e not hate, but Harry is just so easy to dislike. And I thought, I think one of the reasons that Harry is so easy to dislike is that he embodies all of the worst things that we see in ourselves. And we just want to push him away from us. Just want to get everything that he is away from us. And of course, none of us have ever had the opportunity to be betray our family on the eve of our father's coronation. But all of us have had moments in which we have framed a story and left out details where we get to look a little bit more victimized than we were. Than we were. All of us have had moments in which we have chosen to be to see the negative when we could have seen the positive. All of us have had moments in which we have not pressed forward and tried our hardest at things and have let laziness win the day. Um, all of us have nursed a grudge far longer than we needed to. And so there's just so much in him that it's like he is the, um, he is the embodiment. He is the magnification of every small fault that can become so devastating to us as people if we let them. And he just is, he just has so many things that he's just refused to deal with and address. And, and so he's just repugnant because of those things. But I think he's repugnant to us because we see what it looks like in detail when we let the worst parts of us reign supreme. And I don't know, it's not like he, Harry is not some anomaly, some, some, some version of evil and brokenness that none of us can relate to. I think we can all actually relate to some of the things he does and, and it's very uncomfortable. And so we reject him for that. Um, and we sort of mock him because we don't wanna be those things ourselves. But I don't know, it just makes me look at my own life and I think where, where, am, I, where am I like Harry and, and what can I do to eradicate anything like that? Because when it is left to just live and breed and become a person's personality, man, these character traits are really ugly. And I think the ugliest thing throughout this whole book is his, is his inability to see the positive when it would have been completely possible to, if he had just applied himself to see that it wasn't always terrible. And the elephant, for a brief moment, he seemed to get that from the elephant. The world isn't always all bad, but he doesn't seem like he really clung very hard to that sentiment. So anyway, um, I will see you again on Tuesday. We have our next episode on Tuesday. I hope you guys have a really restful Sunday. Bye.